And another thing that is um, very much a turnoff, and this is with both candidates, stop trashing each other. We don't care. Stop trashing Trump. Trump, stop trashing the vice president. Shut the f up! You just heard from Pam Thistle, a self-important undecided voter who was one of five panelists to participate on that CNN panel. Now, that vapid point that she made apparently resonated deeply with the other panelists because, of course, it did. They all seem to agree that part of the reason why they just couldn't make up their minds is because the candidates are just too mean to each other. Yeah. Now, even though these insufferable morons made me want to pull out my f***ing hair, I've got to say, it was really cathartic to read the comments to that video posted on CNN to see that even CNN's audience, who's traditionally more centrist, was completely fed up with people like this. But before we get to that, let's get back to Pam, who is going to share her reasoning in the following clip. And uh, brace yourselves. It's not, it's, <laughs> it's not the most intellectually rigorous argument here. We don't care. The voters don't care. We don't even know the people they're talking about, that this person said this and that. How does that impact the voters? That's who you're talking to. That's who you're serving. We, this, this feels like high school the gossip. Mm -hmm. We don't care. We don't want to hear it. Okay, here's the problem with what you're saying, Pam. What you dismiss as mere gossip is actually crucial information that, in theory, should persuade people like you. That, in theory, should be pertinent to you making your decision, if you ever make your decision. And to be fair, I don't know what she was particularly referencing with regard to the Kamala Harris town hall that they were discussing, but it does seem like this is the particular moment that she took issue with. You've quoted General Milley calling Donald Trump a, a fascist. You yourself have not used that word to describe him. Let me ask you tonight, do you think Donald Trump is a fascist? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I, and I also believe that the people who know him best on this subject should be trusted. So it seems like Pam was talking about that moment where Kamala correctly called Donald Trump a fascist and based that assessment on the gossip from people like General Mark Milley and Trump's own chief of staff, John Kelly, who also called Trump a fascist and said that Trump would rule like a fascist and even praised Hitler for doing some good things, which mm, sounds a little bit fashy if you ask me, but Pam doesn't care because she doesn't even know who Mark Milley or John Kelly is. And to her, all of this just seems like high school gossip. In other words, even though the people who worked closely with Donald Trump are warning everyone, people like Pam, that he wants to be Hitler too. Pam just thinks, you know, it's a little bit mean for Kamala to call him the F word. And because of that, she's still undecided in part. Pam, go fuck yourself. Now, <laughs> to be fair, she did say that Trump was also too mean to Kamala, so she's both sides in it. So after hearing Kamala be mean to Donald Trump, according to Pam, and call him a fascist, let's see the kind of insults that Donald Trump tends to uh, use against Kamala Harris, just for comparison's sake. And there's something wrong with her, too. She's slow, low IQ, something. I don't know what the hell it is, but they lie. I've never, we, we don't need another low IQ person. She is a very dumb person. Yeah, low IQ, dumb person, fascist who praised Hitler. Seems like these are basically the same, according to Pam. Good job, Pam. Makes sense. But I've been picking on Pam a lot, rightfully so, I think. But to be fair, she wasn't the only person to make this point about both candidates being too mean to each other. Because as I stated at the start of this video, the entire panel agreed with that stupid-ass vapid point. So let's hear from other people. We don't care. We don't want to hear it. You're, you're all nodding about that. Yeah, we uh, don't As someone who's covered a lot of campaigns, uh, I'm not here to take you know sides. Trump's but about. You know what Trump's about. Okay, that, that's, that's the yeah, point I was trying to get at. talking about In, in the sense that if, you're, if you are her... Yeah. I would you know, say, Donald, but, but if you look at the numbers, Donald Trump is running stronger now than he was running in either 2016 or 2020. Okay. So if you're her, you're thinking, I need to try to disqualify him sometime. Okay. But, but you're all telling me that you would prefer she do that by making a more affirmative case. Yes. Th this, is why you this is why you should pick me over here. I would say exactly that for, I think, 
from prior to even entering the race um, as the presidential candidate. And then once she ultimately was nominated for a very long time, she didn't stoop to his level. And as of late last couple of weeks, I've really started to see, like you said, this schoolyard bullying. And I think that's beneath her. She doesn't need to do that. She can run on her policy. She can run on her position. You don't need to stoop to his level. And I really think that's what it is. Um, and, you know, I respect her more for that if she would just stay out of that that arena. Dumb point, but Tanisha does get a little bit of a pass for me because she's one of the two people on that panel that actually made up their minds while watching the town hall, but she's still engaging in a false equivalence. And to the extent that Kamala is being mean to Donald Trump, it's nowhere near as mean as she should be given the buffoonery that we see from him on a daily basis, not to mention the fact that he is a legitimate threat to democracy and he praised Hitler. If that doesn't warrant somebody being a little bit mean, then is there ever a reason to be a little bit direct about someone? Would you clutch your pearls if somebody said that Hitler was bad and it was good that he killed himself? Would you clutch your pearls at us condemning Viktor Orban and the authoritarian policies that he implemented in Hungary? Where do you draw the line? Is it ever okay for us to be mean to fascists? I don't know. So the, the pearl clutching that we're seeing from these undecided voters, it is so fucking irritating. I hate it. And I actually don't even care that much about Trump's insults. I don't care about what they say to each other and how mean they are. I'm more focused on what Trump would do as president. But it's frustrating to me that this is so salient to these undecided dipshits. I'm sorry, but I could not care less if Kamala Harris is being a little bit not nice to Hitler too. I care that we have somebody who's running for president that essentially wants to be Hitler too. That to me is a little bit more of a pressing matter that I should consider as a voter. But apparently to these people, they just want them to be nice, right? You can have Hitler and fucking, I don't know, Bernie Sanders. And they're like, mm, Bernie was a little bit mean. So it just seems like, I'm going to have to consider Hitler. I just, I don't know what these people want. And I feel like they don't know what they want either. But I do want to go back to Pam because before she chastised both candidates for being too mean to each other, she talked about an actual conversation that she had with Kamala Harris herself. And what she says here gives us so much insight into the narcissistic mind of the undecided American voter. You also had a conversation. I did. With the vice president yes. after. Uh, she immediately, you're the first one she sought out. That's lovely. Uh, yeah. Tell me about it. But what you can, I don't want to violate your privacy or her privacy, no, okay. but the, the, to the point you I, can. And I really felt that. And I really, um, I came out of this uh, feeling, um, uh, just kind of a feeling of adoration of her personally. I think personally she is a good person and there was a nice connection, especially as a woman. There are a lot of things that I connect with her as a woman. Um, However, I am very big on details. I'm big on numbers. Mm -hmm. um, I am a widow with 100% responsibility for my family, for my kids, for their tuitions, for my bills. And so I do my own taxes. I'm very much on top of every dollar. And so um, that is where, and I'm not really getting it from either candidate, to be honest. Yeah, so guys, like, mm. The vice president had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me and it made me feel so seen and so important, but I would like a little bit more time with her. Perhaps we can go out for tea. And I'd also, before making a decision, like to have a private conversation with Donald Trump, not so I can hear about policy, but primarily so I can talk about myself and hear him applaud me for doing my own taxes. That's what would help me make a decision. I mean, do you see what's happening here? Every single undecided panelist we hear from is a self-obsessed narcissist who wants the candidates to woo them. They like feeling important and wanted because all of these people have main character syndrome. And unsurprisingly, Pam is still undecided. You know what, Pam? Just don't vote. Don't fucking vote. Save yourself the agony of deliberating any longer and just stay the fuck home and watch Gilmore Girls. Just don't vote. Because if you still can't make a decision with less than two weeks before the election after having talked to one of the candidates, I just think that you should spare yourself the difficulty and just save those two brain cells that barely work and just veg out, watch TV. This is too much for you. Honestly, this is too much for you. And I know it sounds like I'm being a condescending prick, but that's the purpose. I think that 
to the extent that I'm being mean to Pam, it's not mean enough. People like her are exactly what's wrong with this fucking country. But I do want to move on to Joe, who's still super undecided as well, because even though Trump might be a little bit fashy, you know, it's hard to tell, he just can't tolerate the fact that Kamala would let women have autonomy over their own bodies. And even though she literally had a private conversation with him as well, he's still really struggling to make this fucking decision. So let's watch Joe. I think there are still, first off, I, I certainly respect the vice president and the work that she uh, is doing uh, in her office. Um, I think that there are still some, at least for me, some personal policy differences. Um, I don't think that I still can't get behind her uh, policies on abortion. That's just something that I, I can't get behind because that's the right to life is so fundamental in this country that it becomes without that right being respected. It's incredibly difficult to talk about anything else. So I have a policy difference, a number of policy differences with her. That's the biggest one that comes to mind. But at the same time, I'm also I'm still not sold on the former president either just because of his his personality his actions on january 6th uh just the way that sometimes he treats people it's that gets to be a little bit difficult for me so two quick follow-ups here no, number one so you don't you're not leaving here planning to vote for trump you're leaving here still not knowing what to do i came in here leaning uh in uh the direction of the former president uh i have not made a final decision okay. uh, the Vice President approached you mm -hmm. as she was walking out, and yeah. we could hear a little bit of it from afar. But you were having a conversation about your disagreement on abortion. Yes. Um, obviously, you still disagree with her. Um, what did it mean to you that she took the time to talk to you? Did it did it mean anything at all? It meant quite a bit, actually. I, I will respect that. Anybody who's willing to hear ideas that are in opposition to hers, and that's or or to anybody's really, for that matter, that's something that. That is a personality trait that I really appreciate, and that is certainly something that, um, like, I try to have in myself. I try to, I do try to listen to as many uh, points of view as possible in my day to day life to to try to get that. So I, I appreciate that element for her. It's just sometimes this can be so very fundamental that that particular issue can be so very fundamental to how we talk about anything else the the right to life uh not just abortion but the respect of life from the beginning to the end uh, is so very fundamental to how we operate as a country joe i'm gonna say something and i genuinely hope that you take this the worst way possible you are never going to be in a situation where a woman you impregnate might have to make that decision ever and whatever chance you had of getting that close to a woman in the first place was just dashed by your appearance on this scene in town hall every subsequent woman that you meet in your life is going to see this and think less of you rightfully so now if the right to life is so fundamental to you from beginning to end why isn't health care a bigger concern to you a pre-COVID study from Yale found that Medicare for all would save 68,000 American lives per year so if you care about life Harris backing away from Medicare for all should be the biggest issue for you. Speaking of life, as president, Donald Trump vetoed bipartisan legislation that would have ended U.S. complicity with Saudi Arabia's genocide in Yemen. Does that even register to you? Does that even qualify as life since it's Arab lives and not American lives or unborn lives more specifically? What about the fact that Harris refuses to call for an arms embargo on Israel, even though we know that they're using our weapons to indiscriminately slaughter thousands and thousands of innocent civilians in Gaza and Lebanon now? Nothing. Does Trump's refusal to support basic gun safety regulations worry you at all, given the plethora of mass shootings that happen at schools every single year? See, listen, here's my problem with you, Joe. You're full of shit. You don't actually care about life. You care about controlling women. That's your main concern. So drop the moral grandstanding and just say that with your full chest and be brave. Although saying something like that would require a level of commitment and decisiveness and courage that you clearly lack as an undecided voter with two weeks left before the fucking election. But the problem is that these people think they're larger than life and refuse to acknowledge that this election isn't about them. It's about all of us. And that fact alone should humble them, but it doesn't. And one would think that Joe of all people would agree with me on this since he made that same exact point verbatim without a single shred of self-awareness. I'm not joking about this. In the presidency, 
you need to acknowledge that as well because you have so much around you that can sometimes lead you to think that you're larger than life. And at a certain point, we have to acknowledge that there is something bigger than us, whatever that something is to an individual, we have to acknowledge that there is something bigger than us that helps us or that and that helps us be humble in the or in our daily life. Yeah, if only people weren't so self-centered, right, Joe? I I can't with these fucking people. I swear to God, they're going to make me lose my fucking mind. Now, to be fair, he was talking specifically about presidential candidates, but still, he wasn't realizing the irony in what he was saying, and he didn't acknowledge the fact that he was doing the thing that he was saying you shouldn't do. But to be fair, there were two voters that did actually make up their minds, and they decided to support Harris, both of them. So, good job. You did it with two weeks to spare. Uh, I mean, congratulations. One of them was Tanisha, and another was Eric. Now, let's hear the reasoning as to what helped push Eric over the edge for Kamala Harris. One of the things that stood out to me was when, I believe it was you, that asked the weakness question. You know, what is, what is your biggest weakness? And she brought up that she has people around her that she can trust, that she can get the answer from. In my line of work in IT, I don't expect everybody to know the answer. I expect them to know how to get the answer. And her specifically, th that resonated with me because I don't need a president that knows everything or thinks they know everything because that's not what America needs. Sure. They need to put the right people in the right place to lead the country efficiently. One person can't lead this country. Right. They need a team. And that's, right. that's what resonated with me. <laughs> so, so, okay. Kamala simply saying that she's going to have advisors like all presidents, mind you, that is what basically pushed him over the edge and convinced him to support her. That's what did it. OK, believe it or not, Eric is not the first undecided voter to really like that a presidential candidate pointed out the fact that they're going to have advisors because in a different CNN town hall that I talked about after the vice presidential debate, one guy who was still undecided, albeit encouraged by Tim Walls saying that he was going to have advisors, said the same thing that Eric said, although unlike Eric, he was still undecided. Let's watch. It, it is very important that we have expertise when making these decisions in policy, right? And so him bringing, bringing um, the specifics to say that we need the expertise um, making these decisions, I, I believe that was very important. And that in, in, that in turn made me, you know, turn my favorability towards him. Bitch. What the fuck? It is, <laughs> it is so insane to me that if you're running for president, you can win over like 10%, maybe 20% of undecided voters by just letting them know that you're also going to have advisors as president. <laughs> What do you what do you what do you say to that? What do you say to people like this who are so fucking stupid? And listen, these people are fucking stupid. I know some of you will come at me in the comments and say that I'm being too mean, but I'm sorry. You're wrong. I think that they are objectively stupid. And I say that with the utmost disrespect. I hope that they hear me say that. I hope they find the video, watch it, and I hope that their feelings are hurt genuinely. And guess what? You might think I'm a prick for saying that, but I'm not alone because if you look at the comments on the CNN video, they echo the same shit that I was saying. Now, I've made you wait long enough to see those comments, so let's dive in because they were ruthless. This person says, I am embarrassed by the lack of critical thinking of the average American, right? They're not undecided voters. They know who they're voting for. They just can't seem to find the courage to say it out loud and defend why. To be undecided a month out is somewhat fair, but two weeks away? Come on now. I think this is probably true to an extent. This person says undecided voters on TV equals clout chasers. 1000%. This person adds, imagine these people deciding the fate of the country. Scary stuff. I know, right? That's why I'm so frustrated by this. The woman saying, we don't know who these people are, lives under a rock. Mm-hmm. Wait, did she just call Kamala's attack on Trump schoolyard bullying? WTF do these people see? I don't know. I genuinely don't fucking know. Where does CNN get such weirdos from? Great question. They are enjoying their five seconds of fame. Undecided idiots. Thank you. Those undecided voters are dumber than Trump. 
you can make that case. He probably decides to eat when the food is already in his mouth. Most of these people are lying, right? These are the dumbest people on the planet. Undecided people are just attention seekers. I agree. And last but not least, closely watching it from Ireland, and it's absolutely insane. What happened to such a great country? Yeah, I mean, when you mix stupidity and indecisiveness with an overinflated sense of self-importance, you get the undecided American voter. But I will say that the silver lining is that as divided as we are as a country, we're at least able to unite in our collective hatred of these narcissistic dipshits. So there's that, I guess. Recovery mode, my brain ideas. Recovery mode, my brain ideas.